Welcome to another edition. <clears throat> and I was just doing some thinking and researching for this particular segment. Now I came across something I wrote in January of 2020. And I entitled it, I Wonder. And I think I wrote this um, at the, um, uh, oh, I'm going to say urging, but it wasn't quite that significant of a peer that asked me, <clears throat> what do you wonder about these days? And I think I may have been on uh, <clears throat> a vacation when I wrote this, because in, in January of 20, it was right before we knew of this thing called a pandemic, <clears throat> and my wife and I had taken a cruise about that time. Um, and so it was um, kind of interesting to look back at this. And the first thing that I was wondering about was um, starting to do training in, in IFS. And I, at that time, I'd been doing IS, IFS <clears throat> therapy for about three years. And I was, I had already signed up for the formal level one training. And I wrote, uh, just like I got the formal training in Enneagram, which I still haven't talked a lot about in the podcast. Um, it's nine personality or nine character structures. And maybe, maybe someday I'll do a series on that. Um, and I got, I think I went to like eight different trainings on the Enneagram and used it for my own personal development. And I said, I'll probably use the IFS training for my own development, which was curious. And at that time I, I put, I wonder if IFS has a place in the financial therapist toolbox. And my first training was in February of 2020 in London. And then of course the pandemic hit after that and it closed down and we finished the training on, uh, on Zoom. And it was the last week of that training that it hit me, wow, I think it's possible for IFS to be used with financial therapy. It's interesting to me that I was kind of pondering that ahead of time, but was really doing it for my own personal edification. So um, I think looking at this uh, three and a half years later that I've um, pretty convinced that IFS does have a place in the financial therapist toolbox and can be used um, very effectively to help people get unstuck around uh, financial issues, money issues. Um, then the second thing I wrote was interesting. I wrote, I'm wondering if MDMA assisted therapy will have a place in the financial therapist toolbox. I think I gave or sponsored a, a discussion or a session on this at the Nazrudin Project retreat in 2018 or 2019. I think it was 2019. And for those of you that are not familiar with uh, uh, MDMA assisted therapy, there's a, a uh, lot of clinical research that has been going on, well, from, <laughs> for quite some time. Um, I think um, maybe, I don't know, I hate to say, say a date exactly, but 2016, 17, 18, probably, probably before 2018. <laughs> 
um, to see if uh, MDMA, which is a oh, it's it is a um, not specifically a psychedelic, but a a form of it uh, can be used to treat PTSD. And the uh, stats at the time I took uh, a course in this were just really um, amazing. And PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. And typically you associate PTSD with someone who's had a cat catastrophic life event, uh, a big T trauma. And like with all traumas, there's a lack of integration. Uh, memories are stored incorrectly. From all this, a person can have flashbacks, um, fear, anxiety, nightmares. Uh, that's all the the uh, vulnerable parts that were super wounded uh, that are active or activated and uh, the exiles in IFS speak <clears throat> and then the firefighters stop in to try step in to try and calm all that <clears throat> with uh, drug misuse alcohol self-harm even suicide <clears throat> so it can, it's a pretty big thing um, somewhere between uh, six and ten percent of people that have had <clears throat> PTSD have it for a lifetime and so it can be really disabling um, and mixed in with this PTSD can be something called complex <clears throat> trauma which isn't a big T trauma but it's a little T trauma that happens over and over and over and over so uh, this particular study really focused soldiers coming back uh, especially from Iraq and Afghanistan uh, where they found like just about 5% of British soldiers had PTSD and it ran as high as 18% in U.S. soldiers. So they experimented with this. MDMA is the, I don't know if it's the clinical form, it's the official form of uh, a street drug called ec ecstasy, <clears throat> but it's very pure and very clinically controlled. <clears throat> and it is used in conjunction with therapy, psychotherapy. <clears throat> that's, a, that's a real important connection. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's not something that somebody does by themselves, it's definitely not done for recreation, um, but it is is done to help somebody um, gain insight and objectivity on the, the trauma and help to process the trauma. And the stats at the time that I, I got these, which I think was in 20, 2017 maybe, <laughs> Um, of 100% of the people that qualified for a PTSD diagnosis, um, somewhere around, they, they did uh, talk therapy and then they did the uh, MDMA assisted psychotherapy. And I, I think that uh, consisted of several sessions, therapy sessions prior to doing the MDMA session. Um, the MDMA session, I think typically lasted like six, eight hours, would have two therapists present, and then it would have follow-up therapy after that session. And I think it involved a second session, which again, two therapists worked with, and then follow-up after that in integration. Um, and then they did just uh, standard talk therapy one-on-one -on -one talk therapy and what they found is of these uh, people that had a, 
a, a diagnosis of PTSD. 83% of them still had the diagnosis after doing talk therapy for, and, and this may have been, um, oh, they followed up on them uh, for two years and, and three years, I think. But whatever that time was, 83% still had the diagnosis of PTSD. Put around, put another way, 17% improved enough that they no longer were diagnosed with PTSD. However, with those that went through the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, only, I think it was about 24% had the diagnosis of PTSD. Put another way, 76% uh, actually could no longer be diagnosed. Now that's phenomenal. <laughs> that's, that's not even close. And eventually this is going to lead to MDMA uh, being available under prescription. They thought it would have happened by now back when I took uh, this particular workshop. But um, it, uh, it hasn't happened as of, of yet. Um, and I, I was wondering, would that be a tool in the toolbox of people that are really suffering from um, being stuck around uh, a, a severe money issue? Uh, for example, overspending, uh, gambling could be one. Uh, I suppose even underspending to the fact that it uh, puts, you, puts you and maybe your family at risk of uh, not having the house up to whole real habitable standards, safety issues, uh, nutrition issues, things like that. Uh, and the reason I was wondering about it is, and I, I wrote this before I was starting to do IFS uh, therapy uh, with financial therapy clients. Uh, heretofore, I had noticed that really financial therapy seemed to move pretty slowly, especially the more traumatized uh, that a person was, the more uh, wounding that they had, uh, the slower the progress was in financial therapy. And here's the deal is with financial therapy, the longer it takes a person to get well of sorts, the more expensive it is, right? Uh, if I am overspending and I continue this overspending, um, the, the sooner that I could get that, uh, spending modified, um, the less expensive it's going to be. So if there are tools that can speed up the financial therapy process, this would be of great interest to both the financial therapist and the financial therapist client. So that was just something I w was wondering about. And <laughs> I'm still wondering about that. Um, I could, I could go into, uh, go a lot of different directions with this. And I know the first time I ever heard of this, I was like, oh, oh that's not good. And drugs are not good. Especially drugs that quote, mess with your mind and quote, and as I really started looking at the evidence and the research behind this, um, psychedelics used in this way are extremely successful and have less side effects than some of the, the, the drugs I use just uh, for everyday uh, issues of uh, aging. <clears throat> so I kind of had to get over that because in my youth, I always associated uh, these types of drugs 
as being recreational and and highly dangerous. Well, it's what people did on them, on unsupervised, so to speak, that was really dangerous. And they were completely abused in the 60s. So we're, we're talking about using them actually for the purpose in which they were originally uh, created for. So that's out. It's, it's going to be a long time before uh, um, MDMA assisted therapy would be used by a financial therapist that would be trained. Um, and there, there's training going on now, I believe the goal has been to train 10,000 therapists in the use of uh, MDMA assisted therapy. And I know a number that have graduated and they're, they're waiting for this to become um, legal or being able to be prescribed. I think there's, there's a, a f couple states where this can be done right now. Um, Oregon, I believe, is one of them. So that was a wondering I have. It's pretty, pretty far out there in a way. Um, but it's, like I said, the, the whole intent is how can we speed up financial therapy in its um, agenda of bringing financial well-being into a person's life? Um, and there was a couple of other things that I was wondering about. I wrote, I'm wondering if the financial planning experience can be deepened by forming groups of clients that meet regularly like a therapy process group. And this is something that Cicely Mayton, who had a practice out of Chicago, Illinois, and I have we talked about this a lot over 20 years. As most of you know, I uh, became acquainted with group therapy back in, must have been the 90s, early 90s. And I mean, this is this was what kind of start, started my path into combining therapy with financial planning was that money was rarely, rarely talked about in group therapy. So I, um, I and I helped start the first financial therapy workshop with Ted Klontz in 2004 or five, I think is when we started designing that. Uh, and we found, yeah, you can do definitely can do therapy around money and you can do therapy in a group. And my own personal experience with group therapy was that I progressed, I progressed faster in a group. Uh, I seemed to learn more in a group than one-on-one -on -one talk therapy. Now, since then, like I said, I discovered IFS and that's, IFS is um, primarily one-on-one -on -one therapy. And it has, um, obviously, I get something out of it or I wouldn't be in my seventh year of doing it. Um, so the question is, can we deliver financial planning experiences in group? And I really believe the answer is yes. Um, in my financial planning practice, we did form a group, oh man, it must've been four years ago, of clients. Uh, I believe there are six or eight of them. And they, the cool thing about a group is you get to hear other people's experiences. You get to find out you're not terminally unique. You, once you feel safe, you can talk about things that you feel great shame around, whether it may be overspending or underspending or um, uh, financial enabling. I mean, just the whole list of 
uh, financial problematic financial behaviors that we've talked about in the podcast and come to find out that admitting those um, those weaknesses or those things that feel so shaming other people <laughs> have them too and you actually get acceptance and connection rather than judgment and separation that's a power that's a power of group that's a power of a 12-step program and so it becomes a, a real bonding experience with the group and this particular group um, was still going uh, long after we ended the group um, even oh, well, I'm gonna say it was still meeting three years after um, we ended it because they built such a strong bond um, so I, I said recently at a conference I was at um, a financial planning co conference and actually raised this question can we do groups for our clients um, that we had such good success with a group that we stopped it and we've never done it again <laughs> well um, part of the the issue with me is just having the time I got so many ideas and so little time um, and I was told at this particular conference there actually are several other financial planners or financial coaches that have started groups uh, certainly financial therapy can be delivered in a group and IFS can be delivered in a group there's a, a book um, I'm looking to see if I can put my hands on it it uh, was was written I, I can't find it right now oh yeah here we go it's called um, creating healing circles by Chris Burris and it's using IFS in facilitating groups so I think we can put together uh, financial therapy and IFS into a group experience and it would probably be really um, powerful but that hasn't been done those those two combinations have not been done oh will I get a chance someday to uh, play with that oh that would be that would be interesting I uh, I would enjoy doing that um, and as I talk about that every financial therapy client that I have is on zoom so for me it would be putting together these groups uh, on zoom which absolutely can work not as effective as in person but still I'm sure that they would be very effective but I am still wondering uh, about that and about applying um, applying that applying financial therapy and IFS in the group setting another thing I wrote down as I said I'm wondering if our workplaces can become agents of transformation similar to churches and therapy groups when we think of transforming and really changing um, and, a pro and uh, opening uh, emotional well-being in our lives many will expand emotional well-being or say it's a a subset of spiritual well-being and certainly when we think of places of transformation I think we we uh, certainly can think of um, uh, religion in the broad context and therapy groups what we don't think about are our workplaces <laughs> and not so maybe transformation but oftentimes maybe not in a positive way many years ago there was a book written called deliberately developmental organizations DDOs and it featured three companies in it 
And on my website, on Kaler Financial Group, I have a page uh, devoted to DDO. And we like to, to think of ourselves as, as a form or some type or taking a stab at being a deliberately developmental organization. I don't know that we've done a great job at it. But um, we do try to embrace some concepts that are unusual in the workplace, which would be like, don't leave your personal life at your door. Uh, uh, we don't want you to have two jobs, one the job you were hired for and the other job of hiding who you are, what's going on in your life, or trying to live up to the expectation of the workplace. Um, so I think a lot can be done in our companies, in our workplaces, to try and make them places you know, that can, at the very least, support personal development and give opportunities for that type of growth. Uh, it can only benefit the company and I think can be used pretty powerfully. Um, it, when you talk about it directly, it doesn't seem to be you know, based on the bottom line profit, but anytime you can help people grow and help people uh, uh, attain um, a greater degree of well-being, it's got to benefit everybody, the, the company, the customers, the clients, and the workforce. So uh, some other, as I close up here, uh, things I was wondering about, as I said, I wonder what it would take to attract a financial planner to Rapid City. <laughs> uh, I, I could say that now finally, after 12 years of a, of a drought, Finally, we had a financial planner actually moved to Rapid. We've been, we, we went virtual largely in, in 2019. Um, I was also wrote down, I wonder if I should start a financial therapy podcast. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't, what, uh, uh, 21, 22, 23, it wasn't, until a year and a half later that I wrote this, that I actually started the podcast. So, well, that is the uh, some of my wonderings, but I, I thought a lot of that was very, very pertinent to what we talk about week in and week out. So I thought that I would share that with you. So. Thanks again for your attention. I run into so many of you as I'm starting to travel the country and go to retreats and do speaking that, that listen to the podcast. And so I do really appreciate your interest and your attention. And please reach out to me with any questions or comments you have at rick at rickkaler.com. So thanks uh, again, and I'll look at talking with you next week.